All right, thanks guys. Thank you for coming to a talk of mine that is not a security talk, which is really weird. If you want to come to a security talk, come this afternoon uh, and we'll actually break stuff, which is, which is kind of fun. But this is going to be fun, but it's just very different because this is sort of more about, I guess, the softer side of what we all do. And I actually didn't realize how important that was and how interested software people were in the softer side of building a career until my wife started doing soft skills talk and did really well. And I was like, there might actually be something in this. I should have a shot of this. So what I thought I'd talk to you about is effectively managing your career in ways that sort of help you grow and expand and do more awesome things. Now, that might be awesome things in the place you're at now. It might be awesome things going and working for someone else. It might be awesome things going and doing your own thing. The intention is to sort of be cross-cutting and make sure that you have things out of this that will work no matter where you go. Now, having said that, a lot of this is about my experiences at this place just here. So I worked at Pfizer, which is out in West Ride here in Sydney, for uh, 14 years. And in case you don't know who Pfizer is, you probably know what we made. <laughs> in case you don't, they're the emails you get every day. <laughs> so that was these guys. So I work at Pfizer, and a lot of people might think that it must be a lot of fun working for a company that makes Viagra. Like, the whole place must just be a barrel of laughs, right? <laughs> and admittedly, there were bits of it that were, and bits of it that weren't. A little bit like any job, I guess. So anyway, I started writing a blog. This was back in about 2009 now. And there are many reasons why I started writing the blog. And it's just sort of interesting to look back at it now. And, and this is the first blog post I ever wrote. Why online identities are smart career moves. And the premise of this was that I thought it would be a good idea to have some sort of online presence. And a, a lot of this was sort of dawning on me as I was interviewing other people. So I'd interview other people for roles, and they'd send in their CV. And you wouldn't believe it, every CV said they were awesome. All right? It's always like, I'm great at this, I'm great at this. You know how some CVs sort of rate all the technologies, and they're fantastic at you know, C Sharp, HTML, Notepad, all these things. <laughs> and then they'd go, yeah, but you know, speak to my references. I've got references. And they'll tell you that I'm awesome as well. All right? So you chose the references, right? <laughs> you know, so it's always going to be this sort of echo chamber of self-ingratiating feedback. And I thought I'd write this post, and there's sort of a few things in here that, that I look back on now and were a bit more insightful than what I knew at the time. So I'd, I'd said things like, look, I reckon one of the best things you should do as a developer is to have a good online profile. Now, when you have a good online profile, it means things like this, like being able to actually illustrate your competency and your interests over time. So rather than just being like a, a one-hit wonder, I did this you know, fantastic thing, here's my CV, it's great, let's show a track record of success. So that was sort of the theory, and I went on to say, look, I, I'm not trying to change my job at the moment. It's not that I want to go somewhere else now. It's that I don't know if in the future I might want to. And I think I was sort of partly writing this because I wanted to, to cover my own ass. Because I was like, if my boss reads this, you know, like it, it may not go down so well. Now, as it turned out, it, it took me about five years before I really hated my job. And it took me another year after that before I was actually gone. But because I started thinking about this back then, it made the time I had at the job significantly more enjoyable. And it meant that when the job did finish, I had some really neat options. And that's sort of what I want to talk about here. Now, I'm just going to redo this machine because it is not spitting content out the right way it should. And we'll go there. Watch plural site. All righty, that is better. OK, so we did that, we did that, we did that. Now, I want to talk a little bit about where it was that I was working and what I was actually doing there as well. And hopefully this will give you some context. So I'm going to sort of tell you as much as I can openly and candidly and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of it as well. So I would go out to West Ryde, and I'd go out to this spot here. And this was the manufacturing plant out there. So we made, among other things, Viagra at the plant out there. 
And I'd go out into my office, which was in this little building here. And there's an interesting thing that happens with the technology department. I'm sure this will resonate with many of you. They kind of put them in the most inconvenient spot, all right? Because you're not meant to be publicly facing. And at the end of the day, your developers, look, you're all in hoodies. Who cares where we put you? So, so I ended up down here. This is my office. And it was an office in the middle of the building, in the basement of the building. So of course, you got no windows. Now, my boss, he had windows. It was important for a boss to have windows, because that's reflective of status. There are other people that had the same seniority as me, but because I'd been there at the time I moved into here, about 12 years, other people had been there 12 and a half years, they got to get windows. So, <laughs> and this was what it was like, very, very hierarchical. Many organisations are still like this. So that was where I was, and it's, it's sort of interesting now to, to juxtapose this to how life looks today, because very regularly today when I work, I work from here. Now, I did this talk in Norway a couple of months ago, and I'm sure people were looking at this going, yeah, that's pretty much what I expect all of Australia's like. <laughs> <laughs> and we do keep telling them that too, by the way. But anyway, this is in all seriousness, this is where I work. I live on the Gold Coast now, and this is South Stratty. Uh, and it's great, because I can ride the jet ski up to South Stratty. I chuck my little laptop in. There's just enough 3G that I can do email and Twitters and things like that. And I go somewhere nice and peaceful that doesn't even need windows. And I ride the jet ski up there, and then I go home, and I ride the jet ski home, and my family's at home. I always arrive very excited when I come home on the jet ski. <laughs> uh, this is during summer when I've worked up a bit more of a tan, obviously. <laughs> so I go home, but in all seriousness, I do ride the jet ski back. And the nice thing about a jet ski is that everybody you ever see on a jet ski is happy. I defy you to find a photo anywhere of someone on a jet ski that's not happy. This was one of the speakers, actually, from NDC here last year. So he came up to the Gold Coast and we went jet skiing and it was all enormously good. And this is genuinely what life is like now. So I ride home down here. This is where we live on the Gold Coast. A lot of houses on the canals in the Gold Coast. People don't realise this. Gold Coast has got more canals than Amsterdam and Venice combined. So a lot of people live on the water like this. So we live there, and I ride back to the house we live in now. And there's a little boat shed, and there's a trolley that comes down the ramp, and you put the jet ski on there, and it takes it up there. And I never worry about traffic. It's one of the reasons I left Sydney, the bloody traffic. But you know, you ride the jet ski around, you don't have to worry about any of that. And I sort of wanted to show this because it, it, it looks nice and sensational and everything, and it is very nice. But I wanted to kind of make the point of how things have changed over time. And I want to kind of take you through that journey of what I did to get there. And I'm overtly conscious that there is always this risk of seeming like a dick. It's like, oh, look how nice this looks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm showing it because I want to try and take you through that path. And as I go through this and I sort of show the way some aspects of life are now, I think the question everyone's got to ask themselves is how you want this to change your life. So what is it that you want to get out of your careers as technology professionals? And look, I mean, obviously, one of them is the money side of things. So this is generally what drives most of us to go to work. You know, like if we had the choice, we said, hey, we'll still pay you even if you don't go into the office. If you've got a job where you'd go in without getting paid, like, good on you, that is awesome. You are exceptional. Because most of us are doing it because at the end of the day, we need to earn a living. So hopefully some of the things you take out of this might give you the opportunity to get more money from your current job, from another job, from independence. There's a bunch of people that are just unhappy with what they're doing at work. <laughs> there are some shit jobs out there, let's be honest. And the things that I'm going to talk about today, many of them made aspects of a job which I increasingly was disenfranchised with, it made it better, it made it happier. I lasted a lot longer <laughs> than what I would have otherwise. And of course, for many other people as well, the desire is just to have more family time. So I want to change the way I work or change the options I have available to me so I can spend more time with family. Many of these are interlinked as well. Certainly when you have the opportunity to earn more money from things, you start to have more choices about how you work as well. So, Let's jump into it, and I want to start sort of talking about the blog side of things. 
Because for me, I showed you the blog, this was really where everything kind of started. And I think with the benefit of hindsight, and it was a little bit hard with my boss because he wasn't particularly technical, particularly going back about eight years, there was sort of less, I guess, openness in technology. Today, I reckon talking to your boss about writing a blog, starting a blog, is actually a really good idea. And one of the reasons for that is that it does help you do your job better. Now, I want to sort of give you some examples of what I mean by that. One of the things that I found very difficult at Pfizer was that due to the structure of the organisation where there wasn't a lot of technical people, a lot of it was outsourced, a lot of it was done by people in other countries, so the people around me were generally managers and marketing people and things like this. And I'd come up with what I thought was a good idea and they'd go, yeah, that's awesome. Like, no matter what it was, they'd be like, yeah, that's what, you know, so long as it didn't cost them money, <laughs> they'd go, yeah, that's awesome, we like this. And what I constantly found, and I'm, I'm sure many people find, is that I was often in environments where I was the smartest person in the room. And that's not to be self-ingratiating, it's just because there weren't other people doing the things that I do around me. And I didn't have a peer group that I could just go, hey, I'm thinking about doing this thing, and they'd come back and say, no, no, maybe you should, you know, do it differently, here's another technical implementation, another architectural pattern. So I didn't have this, but when I started writing and putting things out there publicly, I got a massive peer group. And I'll tell you what, people on the internet, if you do something stupid on the internet, <laughs> they don't say this, I'll show you later on some of the things they say if they don't like you. So the point is you put yourself out there and you start getting all of this interesting feedback from the community. And I'll give you some examples of this. I wrote back in 2010, this five-part series on continuous integration and deployment via TeamCity. And I was actually building out Pfizer's CI environment at the time. And as I was building it, I went, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this whole thing up. So I blogged it, five-part series. Heaps of people read it. And there were an interesting couple of things that happened when I did this. Number one is that if I screwed up in Pfizer, and, and let's qualify this, if I, if I made a claim that was technically inaccurate, or if I had a pattern which wasn't the most optimal, no one was going to call me on it. When you put it out here, they will call you on it, and I knew they'd call me on it. So I put a lot more work into making sure that I had everything spot on, because I didn't want to look stupid. So that was really good. The other thing that happened was that I put this thing out, and all these other people came and gave us free consultation by way of comments, because they come back in the comments, they go, have you thought about doing this? In our organisation, we did that. Here's another tool that may help you. And the penny was dropping for me back in 2010. I was saying to my boss, this is awesome. Like, there's all these people coming and helping us do this thing better, and we didn't even have to pay them any money. And it's very, very true. Go and read the comments on blog posts like this. So that was one example. Another one would be something like this. We were moving to Azure. We had sort of traditional shared hosting-based models, picking everything up, moving it into Azure. And I decided, all right, well, we, we should automate this, because if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, automation is good. So I went and PowerShelled the whole thing, everything from creating the website to the databases to setting up host names, you name it. Did it all in PowerShell and put it out there. And the same thing happened as the Team City series, right? Loads of people popped up and said, have you thought about doing it this way or another more effective mechanism. But one of the things that sort of started to happen as I was doing this is I realised that every hour of effort I invested was now being leveraged much further than what it was before. So I'll give you an example. I would still sit down and write this and do this for Pfizer. I had to go through and document it, write the process, whether I put it on the web or not. I'd have to invest the effort. When I invested the effort and put it on the web, this also started building my profile as the guy that knows stuff about, in this case, Azure. So it sort of started to help build profile, build reputation. It helped a lot of other people. And this is enormously important as well. You know, I've invested the effort, but there's all these other people who have just had a problem solved for them. And look, that may not directly impact the bottom line of Pfizer or put more money in my pocket, but it made me happy. Like, it's nice having all these comments that come back saying, hey, you've just done something that's been really useful for me. And that's kind of the, the happiness part of this, where it made me more content with what I was doing every day. 
And what I find now is, is every time I'm, I'm doing something, I keep thinking about this leverage thing, right? So how can I do this in a way that it doesn't just achieve this one objective, but all these other things happen as a result? And as I go through the rest of the talk, you'll see multiple examples of this. Now, to, to sort of start drawing it to like an actionable item, if you want to write a blog, I reckon the best thing you can do these days is go and get Ghost. In fact, I just saw Ghost was in the news today. They've just launched version 1.0. Been around for four years. A lot of pre-1.0 <laughs> versions in there. But Ghost is fantastic. Great blogging platform without a lot of the dramas that come along with WordPress. When you get a Ghost blog, go and put it on Ghost Pro. You pay 62 cents a day, tax, tax deductible in Australia as well, so it's really less than that, and they manage the whole thing for you. It runs on their platform, they keep it alive, they upgrade it, they support it, they keep the bad guys out. They do all of this stuff. And I've had people in the past go, why don't you run this in Azure and you can manage the server yourself and you can be you know, like your own little kingdom and you can patch it and upgrade it. I don't want to do that, I just want a blog. <laughs> so seriously think about that, get a blog on a managed platform. So that's awesome. Very, very easy to get started. And also go and get a template. You know, there's a bunch of stuff out there that's either free or you pay 10 bucks for, and then you upload it into the site, job done, looks fantastic, responsive, works across everything. Easy peasy. So you can get started very simply. Then you go to Cloudflare and you get HTTPS, because you've got to have HTTPS on this, the security guys keep telling us this. So you've got to do that, and that's free. Not only do you get HTTPS, you get edge caching in 116 different nodes around the world, DDoS defense, a whole bunch of other things. So the point is, it's very cheap and very easy to get this up and running. You can literally do this in the space of an hour, and now you've got a platform where you can start to write stuff. Now, you may not know what to write. I didn't know what to write when I first started, other than that first blog post. That was how far ahead I was thinking. It's like, I should have a blog. Uh, I write about that thing the career thing, and that'll be the start. As I started writing, I wrote stuff like this. This is in chronological order after that first post. Subversion stuff, VS 2010, and incidentally on this, I was just grabbing examples that I found around the web. I was like, let's just find the 25 most interesting things, and you've got to have uh, a number that's an increment of five. I don't know if you notice this when you do a top thing. I learned this from BuzzFeed. <laughs> So I did that, I did some stuff around uh, having a baby to be a better programmer. In retrospect, I do not recommend this, but <laughs> it got me writing. And all of this, sometimes it was scratching an itch, where I was like, I, there was this thing saying, it's bugging me and I want to kind of get it out, I'll, I'll, I'll blog it. And it may not be of much relevance to people, but it got me writing. I went and wrote around things like this, software quality is important. Virgin Blue had screwed something up. Uh, this was my first public shaming of a company, the memories. <laughs> Now, <laughs> some things have changed, some things are still just the same. Uh, things like PDC09, Professional Developers Conference 09. Again, I didn't go to this thing. I was just reading stuff on the web that I thought was interesting and writing it here. And it certainly wasn't ripping it off. It was just like, there's all this noise. Here are the things that I think are interesting. I don't think these were read very much. I think I would have got excited if I had I had 100 people in a week come by and read this. And sometimes now it's 100,000 people in a day that read stuff. But it began with this. Ultimate virtual office. The reason I did this is because I'd already written it on the internal blog and I thought this would be an easy way of putting another blog out publicly, copy, paste, job done. None of this is about security. None of it is about Azure, which are the two sort of biggest things I do these days. I had no idea at this time I was going to be the security guy. The role I had was an architecture role. Security was one little slice of that. And the point I'm trying to make is that you don't have to know what the end goal is. You don't have to know what is it that I'm going to be the specialist in and I'm going to sort of own the space. It's something that gets you started and gets you moving in the right direction. Now, the blog's one thing. I was writing as well for uh, Redgate and their Simple Talk newsletter for a while. And we can see this is sort of nearly seven years ago based on the date. They don't pay you anything, but they give you a platform to put stuff out there. And again, nothing to do with security. That one's nothing to do with security. That one's nothing to do with security. And I didn't earn a cent from any of it, but it all started to contribute to profile. 
And the profile is enormously important, but I needed the platforms in order to do it. And anyone can go and write pieces like this for all sorts of publications. Now, as you do this, one of the things you may find happening is your boss may have a moment of hesitation. Here's something I've heard a few times. If you're in an environment like this, firstly, <laughs> imagine this, because this is the premise, and this is a genuine concern I hear. If the premise is that your boss is concerned that you may get really good at what you do, <laughs> and that it is a problem that you get really good at what you do, I think the writing's on the wall. And I hear the same thing often with training. Like people go, well, if you go to this conference and go to Troy's workshop, you might get good at that, and then you might go and get a better job, better keep you in your box. That's not a good environment. And this happens a lot, many, many places. So the blogging is one thing, speaking is another one. And speaking is an enormously good way of, again, sort of leveraging the effort that you invest. So it's great in so far as obviously you get exposure, you get profile. I'm doing it right now, right? Lots of people in the room. It also really forces you to refine your thinking around the thing that you're talking about. You know, you've got to have confidence in the subject. It makes you much better at what you do. And I think there's a lot of sort of other good social things that come as a result of being comfortable getting up and speaking too. Any of you can go and do this. This was the first public talk I ever did. This was in 2012 at SSW over there in Neutral Bay. So first one I ever did. And I went from there all the way through to last year in Oslo, NDC, doing the opening keynote in front of thousands of people. But it started from that first one, that first little one, and it incrementally stepped up. And any of you can go and speak at events like this. There are calls for paper open at the moment for NDC London. London is a very long way away. They are going to want to get people when they buy international tickets who they know are going to do a good job, but the calls for paper for NDC Sydney will be open a few months from now. Are they, are they what, sorry, are they? I don't, I think they are closing in October. Does it say October? Oh, <laughs> okay, so imagine you fast forwarded one year. I don't, it may come across implicitly, but I don't always pay a huge amount of attention to detail. <laughs> this lady does, thank you. All right, so be that as it may, there are loads of events around, both in Australia and internationally, where you can submit and you can go and speak. And just incidentally, for things like NDC London or Oslo or things like that, and I know there are other speakers in here as well that will back me up on this, you don't get paid to go and speak. No one's paying me to go to, I'll go to London in 2018 and do NDC, but you get a plane ticket and you get a hotel and you get an absolutely awesome experience for a few days. But seriously, think about the likes of NDC in Sydney next year as well. And even as a sort of, I guess, an easier way of easing yourself into this, things like user groups are really good. There are heaps of user groups in Sydney. This was a user group I did a little while ago uh, in Denmark. And in case you don't know, the mechanics of a user group, it can be anything from like a dozen people through to some of them like this, hundreds of people in a big university. And I stand up and you do a, do a sort of a talk about whatever it is that you're interested in, a little bit like this, but quite a bit more casual. And then I sat around for an hour and just answered questions and stuff because there's no schedule. You're not rushing off to see something else. It's very relaxed. So if you wanted to sort of get started, have a look at the local user groups. There's a heap around in Sydney for all sorts of technologies. Another one that's really good if you want to sort of start getting a bit more exposure is speaking on podcasts. So many of you will know these guys. That's a great podcast. There are a heap of them. Uh, now, I'll give you an example, and I'm, I've sort of, I've got a challenge here for you. A uh, mate of mine, Lars Clint, does The Dane and the Pain. Lars is another speaker here. He runs this podcast. He's always looking for people to speak. So I said, hey, I want to put your thing up and offer people, if they would like to talk, to go on your show. So if anyone has something that they think is interesting and they want to share it and sort of start moving in that direction of speaking more, get in touch with Lars or me and I'll connect you to Lars. Go and speak on this podcast. It's easy. You sit there at home on Skype and record it. Simple. 
So in terms of sort of building profile, another really useful resource is Stack Overflow. Now, the reason why I think Stack Overflow is so great is that you can go to someone's profile, you can look at something like this. You can see what are the questions they're asking. Now, for me, when I was employing people, if I couldn't find any presence of someone whatsoever, not even asking a question, that worried me. Because I'm like, what do, you, what do you actually do when you get stuck? And they're like, well, I Google, and I keep Googling. And, go and like, at what point do you stop Googling and just ask for help? And I don't know. But when this is here, it's like now I've got a pretty good idea when you're asking for help. What you're asking for help for. I've got a good idea that you're comfortable asking for help and saying that you just don't know some things. Obviously, answering questions as well, being able to build your Stack Overflow reputation is awesome because you've got this documented independent history of the things that you've been doing. And when you go in and hand your CV to someone and go, hey, I'm awesome, by the way, here's my Stack Overflow profile and it shows what I've actually been doing and the sorts of things I do and don't know, that is enormously valuable independent verification. Another one that's really good is getting involved in projects. So I built a project some years ago now called a Safer Web which was for analyzing ASP.NET websites. And I built this because I had a problem I needed to solve in the office. And the problem was that we were putting all these ASP.NET websites out there, and I'd go and look at it, and it's like, you haven't turned on custom areas. You've got tracing enabled. You've got little, just mundane, stupid things. So I built a project on my own time, and I put it out there, and I made my job at Pfizer easier. I solved that problem, but the leverage was that people started going, Troy's that guy who knows about ASP.NET. And it started building that part of my brand. Now, whether you build your own project, and it's never been easy to do that, because we've got cloud and we've got cheap certificates, free certificates, cheap hosting, everything else we need, or whether you go and contribute to open source or something like that, getting involved in stuff like this is really useful. So I went from that to this one. And many people probably know this one. And this is now an enormously popular, enormously valuable project, which I originally built sitting in a hotel room in the Philippines on a Pfizer trip, because I had time and I had an itch I wanted to scratch. The leverage of this was that many people think, oh, I, Troy did this to, to search for data breaches, which is true. About 50% of the reason I did it is because I wanted to do stuff with Azure in anger. I didn't want to just go, I've read a few blog posts, now I'm going to start moving corporate websites over. I'm going to actually create stuff myself. So I managed to satisfy that requirement, actually getting hands-on experience, and I built this other thing, which in many ways is defining a lot of what I do now. On my spare time, anyone can do this, like literally just sitting at home, building stuff like this for next to no money. Particularly if you've got an MSDN subscription, you've got free Azure credits, dead easy. So, Getting yourself out there and getting that exposure is really good. And what you've got to remember is that when you do that, you are facing the world, right? And there's a sort of a couple of interesting things that happen when you write stuff that faces the world. One of those is that every now and then you're reminded that there are other cultures out there with quite different views to ours. Now, I want to give you an example of this. I did a talk in... Brisbane in January, DDD in Brisbane. And I showed a little video with a hacker. Now, I actually showed this same video here at NDC in Sydney last year as well, but it wasn't until DDD in Brisbane that someone pointed something out to me. Okay, I'll show you the clip very briefly. You may not know it, but you've probably already been hacked. Thousands of hacking attacks occur each day. All right, so that's it. It's like five seconds. And the purpose of this clip is to show that this particular company makes a product called Cujo, is trying to scare people with hackers. Because he's scary, right? He's got a hoodie. He's got green text. We know he's a hacker. And it, it sort of illustrates the, the theme I was trying to, to convey. So I did the usual thing. And I've done this all over the world, too. I've probably shown this 20 times in different talks. Everyone always goes, this is hilarious. It's insightful, yada, yada. One guy came up to me after the talk at DDD. And he said, uh, something about your talk. I'm like, okay, well, maybe he liked it. That's, that's good. And, and he said, yeah, he did like it. It was really good. But obviously, he had 
something that he wanted to get off his chest about the hacker. And he was a little bit pensive. And I'm like, all right, well, geez. <laughs> what have I missed? What's happened? And he, he broached it very, very gently. He said, he's black. I was like, shit, was he? <laughs> I don't know. It's just a hacker. It's a guy from the video. And the penny that dropped is I realized the guy's American. And there is a very, very sensitive stereotype there around race and crime. And if you make that association, people can get upset. Now, after he said this, that the penny dropped, and I think particularly in the last week, we've seen a, you know, terrible things on these lines. And we realize that there, there is this thing in the US which is much more sensitive than places like Australia. And I, I sort of felt, in a way, I felt bad about it because I thought, gee, I hope I haven't, first of all, I hope I haven't upset the guy. Second of all, I hope I haven't perpetuated a stereotype. And then I went back through the slide and I found the other hackers. So this guy's a hacker, he's a hacker, he's a hacker. Uh, I'm not sure what color he is, but he's a hacker. Uh, and this was a bear. Uh, and I, I sort of went, well, you, you know, on, on balance, I'm actually okay with it. So on balance, I don't think I've sort of perpetuated a stereotype, but I'm just now becoming extra conscious of the cultural sensitivities that can be in other parts of the world. And for the most part, we think of the US as being very like us, bar one major exception at the moment we won't get into. <laughs> And it's just interesting, I hadn't really had the penny drop there. But I, I have actually seen this play out multiple times in different forms. And this is a good example here where I wrote this blog post about how to do password resets. And password resets, they sort of seem like a, a simple idea, but it's really easy to screw them up and do things wrong. And I wrote this blog post, and one of the points I was trying to make in here is that when you do a password reset, and you sort of enter your email address and it comes back and it says something, you don't really want that something to say, yes, we've sent you an email versus no, your account doesn't exist, because it's an enumeration risk, right? It tells you whether the account exists or not. And depending on the site, that can be a privacy issue. If it's this site, that's a problem. The reason why there's a porn site on there, which incidentally, I cropped very, very carefully. I had to rearrange pictures. I'm sure, like my wife sees some of the blog posts, right? She's like, what the hell are you doing? It's all research. Anyway, <laughs> in red text, you can see it says, there is no user registered with this email address. Now, the point of it was is that particularly for a site of that nature, and incidentally, a site, let's say a site that deals with depression or medical issues, you have a much higher expectation of privacy. And this really illustrated that point. And I then had multiple comments from people saying, if my boss walked past and saw this on the screen, I'd be in a lot of trouble. And I'm, I'm looking at it going, there's like 5,000 words of text on here and diagrams and charts and things like that. And what is clearly a screen cap in the middle of it, what is wrong with you? But interestingly, it, again, it was a very US dominated audience. And I was checking the IP addresses because I was like, is this a cultural thing? particularly in the US, and I guess there's sort of more conservative parts of the US, they're very worried about it. So I ended up going, OK, the way I'll address this is right up the top, I put a big red box. And I said, in text, further down the page, there is a screen cap of an adult website where you can't see anything you won't see at the beach. If you're worried about this, click here now to replace it with a picture of fluffy bunnies. <laughs> the fluffy bunnies are not wearing any clothes. It's just that little bit I had to get in. <laughs> and I saw this play out again recently where I wrote this. And this was about uh, using Cloudflare and people's perspectives of security. And I, I made one comment in there, just one comment, one sentence, which upset a few people. And I'm sure you'll see why once you read it. Now, this was about October. So it was before he got the job. And a couple of people weren't real happy. Uh, and you know, like this, in a way, it's, it's not a bad comment, but also to sort of go, hey, you've just written thousands of words worth of content which are really useful and can help people do good things. By the way, please don't mention the election. <laughs> I just thought it was really odd. Someone else was a little bit stronger as well. They thought that after the years of earning my reputation, I'd lose it in seconds. So, shit, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> 
he was really upset. A small part of me died today. And it was once I saw that, I was like, all right, mate. It is possible that there are some people out there that are just too easily offended. And I got to thinking about this. Like, maybe there are people that are offended when they shouldn't be, and maybe it doesn't matter that there are always going to be a very, very small, very small slice of people that do get upset. And I found this epic explanation of that by an Aussie comedian called Steve Hughes. So I'm going to play this because I think it perfectly illustrates how we should be looking at this. Yeah. Political correctness, the oppression of our intellectual movements, and no one says anything anymore in case somebody else gets offended. <laughs> what happens if you say that and someone gets offended? <laughs> well, they can be offended. <laughs> What's wrong with being offended? When did sticks and stones make break my bone and stop being mild? <laughs> Isn't that what you teach children, for God's sake? That's what you teach toddlers. He called me an idiot. Don't worry about it. He's a dick. It's very true, right? And look, in fairness, it's not that that gives you free license to go out there and just upset people left, right, and center. But the penny that dropped to me as well is that if you try too hard not to upset anyone, you become enormously boring. You just sort of erode your entire personality. And if at the end of the day, there's one guy that didn't like, well, okay, two guys, that didn't like one comment about Trump, I'm okay with that. And if really, if a little part of him dies inside, so be it. Now, some people take offence slightly differently. And again, people will take offence at things that you could never imagine they will take offence at. Sometimes they get quite upset. And this sort of brings us to the bit where I start talking about how upset people get. One guy got so upset, he created an entire WordPress blog about how much I suck. Unfortunately, it is no longer available because I really, really wanted to get bits of it to show you here. He also created a Discuss account about how much I suck. And between these two, they were dominated by many hours of invested time into explaining to everyone how much I suck. After I got my Microsoft Regional Director Award, which by all accounts is a positive thing, he wrote about how much I sucked. Invested a lot of time. And it's just unfortunate that it's gone, but I was, I was worried because I thought, what if people believe him? What if people genuinely think I suck? So what I'll do is I will make a preemptive strike and I will go out and I will register TroyHuntSucks.com. <laughs> and I did. So this now exists. You can, you're laughing, but you can go there as works. <laughs> and I registered this. And then I had the leverage thing in mind, right, about you've got to try and leverage all the things you do. And I thought, there's another upside to this. Now, have any of you registered a domain recently and not paid for who is privacy? What happens after you do that? Spam. You get calls nonstop from people, normally on the other side of the world, trying to sell you web development skills. And I was ready for this. And I thought, I'm going to get called. And they're going to explain that domain name to me. I wonder how many times I can get them to say Troy Hunt sucks. I got 11 <laughs> out of them. <laughs> My wife is so embarrassed when these calls come in, and she can hear these people talking. And look, I don't have much patience for them, because ultimately, it is cold calling. It's illegal if they were in Australia, because we've got do not call registers and stuff. They're wasting my time. It just seems like fair game. 
Now, a lot of this as well is, is relatively benign insofar as it's not too abusive. It's like it's annoying. It's a little bit funny. But occasionally, it, it does kind of go off the rails a little bit. And I've got some, some sort of very candid feedback here. And there's really two ways we can go now. Who would like to see the censored version? Who would like to see the uncensored version? Well, that's good, because I only have an uncensored version. <laughs> I'm just going to put the comment up on the screen. And in all honesty, like normally, this is what I would read with mates drinking beer. Like, we'd sit around, we'd have a couple of beers, and I'll go, you never believe what I got the other day. And it's funny. But because we're all friends in here. This is normally the reaction when we're doing the beer drinking thing and reading abusive comments as well. It is creative. Uh, I think the thing I like most about this is showing my useless face at a conference and putting this up on the big screen. But this is what does occasionally happen. You get to the point where someone is just unhinged. And if anyone wants to ask me later on, I'll tell you why they made this comment. But it, was, it was, wasn't even to do with security. It was about a GoDaddy thing. And uh, this person was obviously very upset. Uh, they were very offended. <laughs> and, and they left this comment. And in fairness as well, this is nothing compared to what some people get, particularly women in this industry. Some of the shit that they get from people is just absolutely obscene. So for me, it really hasn't gotten much worse than this. In this particular case, I was a little bit worried someone would go a bit further in different ways. But again, that's an off-stage discussion. So occasionally this sort of thing happens, but I don't want you to sort of see this and go, well, I'm kind of afraid to go on the internet now because I might get something like this. Because the reality of it is, there are a huge number of really, really positive interactions. And I find these particularly by the likes of Twitter. And I, I want to sort of change the tone of it. And let's like, talk about the positive stuff and the good things that can come of engagement through channels like this. So, one of the things that I've found really interesting, particularly as, I, as I've traveled around, I've met people in other places, is that there's a huge number of people that I've communicated with online who then turn up at events and want to take selfies. And believe me, no one thinks this is more weird than me, right? When someone goes up and they're like, can we take a selfie? It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, OK, sure. Uh, but you know, the nice thing about this is everyone is smiling. These are all people I met on Twitter, and then they saw me in different parts of the world and said, hey, you know, let's have a photo, let's have a chat. And it was very, very nice. And what I started doing is when I travel, I'll often tweet and I'll say, hey, I'm going to somewhere, I'm going to be in a place. Would you, random follower, <laughs> like to catch up and have a coffee or something? And I've done this in many different countries and met loads of different people, and none of them have been axe murderers, as far as I know. Like, they've all been really, really nice. So things like this bloke down the bottom right, this is Stein, and he did come and see me in Antwerp earlier on in the year. And it was great, because we sort of met up. The guy, I'd, like I'd chatted to on Twitter, had no idea who he was. And he took me for a little tour. And then he gave me the world's best beer. And you know how loads of people go, you know, this is like the best thing in the world. And you go, yeah, sure it is, you know, it's perspective. And I looked it up, and it was the world's best beer. West Flatron 10. So that they keep, it's consistently rated as the world's best. He gave me two of them. Uh, and I did try it, and yes, it was. <laughs> it was sensational. And it was just from meeting up with a random person. So I want to kind of make the point that there are many, many positive experiences that do happen online. Part of the challenge, though, is that when you start to sort of have these online profiles, people follow you because they're interested in something that you do. Now, a lot of people follow me because I do the security things. And what I find sometimes happens now is people will say, I followed you because of the security thing, and then you did something that wasn't security. I'll give you an example of this. I bought a car recently in Melbourne. And I flew down from the Gold Coast, picked the car up, drove to, back to Sydney. In fact, I drove to Sydney to do the agenda committee for this event, and then drove home to the Gold Coast. And I posted a sound of the exhaust on my Twitter feed, because it sounds epic. And someone popped up, very unhappy about this. Why aren't you tweeting about security? I'm following you for security. How dare you have a life involving something that is not security? 
And I was a little bit upset about this, but I kind of ignored it. And what I found was very interesting is immediately after that, someone else said this. And it just kind of reminds you that there are so many people out there with different views. Like, you are going to get people that love what you do and equally people that hate what you do. And I think it's really only when there's a pattern of particularly the former or the latter that you have to worry about. Now, the other thing about sort of being online via social media is that it, it gives you other opportunities to demonstrate who you are. So recently, I got a new machine. And I got this machine, and I went home, and I plugged it in, and I thought it would be interesting to see what a brand new Windows 10 machine, direct from Lenovo, plug it in the network, how much data does it need to download just to update all the packs, service patches, etc. And I found out it was about 12 gig, and I tweeted it. So 12 gig of data, brand new machine. I think there was creators updates and stuff like this as well. And uh, I tweeted this, and I said, uh, stats via UBNT. UBNT is ubiquity. They make the network gear I use. And I said stats by ubiquity because I'd put the table in here, and the table has the numbers. And if I didn't say that, I would have people saying, well, where are the numbers from? And then I'd have this continual you know, response thing. And someone was very upset with that. They really didn't like that those three words were jamming ubiquity down their throat. And when I sort of saw this, I went, every bone in my body now wants to just tell them they're a dickhead, <laughs> you know? <laughs> because this is what it feels like. I mean, it was just such a, a random thing. And I, I kind of thought, well, let's turn this completely around. I'll say something completely different. And I'll acknowledge that maybe it's just something they're not interested in. And just so the person didn't think I was trying to take the piss, put a smiley face. That'll fix it. But here's the interesting thing that happened as a result of that. And the, the, like the whole tone of everything changed. Now, going back, and incidentally, they did refollow me as well. They still follow me today. I checked. Because <laughs> I was like, this is not going to be a good demo otherwise. Uh, going back to sort of the point of the online profile and everything is that interactions like this give you a really good opportunity. Because imagine. Later on, when someone's looking at you, perhaps you're going for another job, for example, and they're going, let's figure out who this person is. We'll look at their social network. And everyone does this, right? You're hiring someone. You're going to look at the publicly available info. And they read through, and they see interactions like that. What are they going to think of me compared to if I had have said, mate, you're a dickhead? That would be a very, very different perception. And it's not that I'm artificially fabricating a persona by responding like I did. It's just that that was the nice thing to do. And it leverages, it has this upside of being a positive thing that other people may see. So we'll change pace on this a little bit, because I want to sort of talk about how I did end up transitioning out of that Pfizer job I spoke about earlier. And it really all started with this. Now, this is a very popular thing in Australia. In lots of parts of the world, you know, we're going to outsource all the things. I'm sure many of you have sort of been through this process of where certain things that you've done in the organisation have moved elsewhere. And the, the Pfizer sort of view of things, and again, it's a very common view, was that you've got people in the organisation that are selling things and marketing things, and they make money. Sales people, marketing people. You've got people like us in the organisation and we cost money. Make money cost money. What we should do is we should get rid of the things that cost us money. Because we're going backwards, paying these technology people. And they increasingly outsourced more and more and more and more to low-cost markets. And of course, all the things that you guys as technology people know would happen did happen, which is part of what made it a very unpleasant environment. But this would sort of continue to surface this favoritism of the sales and the marketing and the, I guess, the negative view of the tech people. And you'd see it over and over again. Sales and marketing, they would have their annual conference there. Hamilton Island, looks nice, doesn't it? So they'd go off to Hamilton Island. We'd have our annual event at the West Ride Lawn Bowls Club. <laughs> now, don't laugh. Everyone got a $20 a head budget. And I'm not making that up. It was $20 a head. This was the Christmas party, actually. You have $20 a head to spend on beer. 
which was barely enough to get drunk enough to make the pain go away. So this was happening over and over again. And then we got through to 2014, I got a new boss, and this boss was in the Philippines. And the role I had, I looked after Asia Pacific, so it kind of didn't matter where I was in the world or where my boss was. So that wasn't so much the issue, but obviously there's a very different cultural set of ideals and values. And when I started reporting, I said, look, I'm, uh, I'm going off to speak at Codemania in New Zealand. And this was going to be in about April 2014. And everyone was cool with this. Yep, no problems. All agreed, all booked in, approved. And then a little bit beforehand, he said, uh, I'd like you to come to Manila in the Philippines for a meeting. I said, well, you know, I can't because of the thing. And he said, no, no, I really want you to come. I was like, yeah, but you really, really know I can't because I'm going to Code Mania and I'm going to talk and people are buying tickets in part because they know I'm going to talk and then I'm going to have a holiday with my wife afterwards over the weekend before I come back to the office on Monday. And then he said, the only priority is the company. And this was literally the sentence. And it was a combination of sort of the outsourcing and the continual sort of devaluation of technology and technology people and attitudes like this that meant every day I was going into work and I was feeling like this. <laughs> if you don't know this feeling firsthand, I'm sure you can imagine it. <laughs> Metaphorically, I was feeling like this. And I'm sure you've all had times in jobs, whether it's a current one or an old one, where you just felt like shit every day. So this was April, and I, I got obviously pretty upset about this. Uh, and I did end up going to the Philippines, and I did end up going to New Zealand as well, but I got there about an hour before my talk started, which was a closing keynote on a Friday afternoon, missed everything, just very upset about it. So I went and uh, got all the paperwork from HR to leave. And I was sort of looking at the paperwork and going, well, if they ask me to leave, it would be much better. And I'll get back to that in a moment. But the thing that I sort of started doing, I said, OK, look, I've, I've got to have an exit plan. Now, I'd had five years worth of blogging and speaking and all this other stuff. And I went, what I've got to do is every opportunity that comes up to write something, to record something, to, to do whatever, I'm going to say yes to. And I clearly remember having this vision of Jim Carrey and Yes Man. So if you've seen Yes Man, it's the one where he just says yes to everything, to really crazy stuff. And his life does all of these wonderful things as a result. I'm not going to go quite to that extreme, but I'm going to say yes to as much as I possibly can. And I was in particular saying yes to Pluralsight courses as well. So I was still writing all of the blogs and all this sort of thing, because that's good exposure and profile. But the Pluralsight courses were enormously useful, because they were getting to the point where they were starting to make money. Now, to make money in a Pluralsight course, people have got to watch them. It's a royalty-based model. The more people watch, the more the authors make. But I was writing enough stuff and building enough profile from the, all the other things I've spoken about earlier on, that by the end of 2014, I was making more money from Pluralsight. I was making more money going home, staying up late, recording courses, recording them on the weekend, recording them on my holidays, than I was going into work every day, getting hit in the nuts, metaphorically. <laughs> and this was great, because it meant that when we got to the end of 2014, my wife and I had this chat, and we said, well, you know, we can pretty much go now. Problem is, is that when you go, now half of your newly adjusted income disappears. But we said, look, we got to do it because there was a trajectory. Um, the only thing that actually made things a little bit more bearable is that my boss had stopped talking to me about six months earlier. <laughs> and I'm not joking. And I had plenty to do because I'd been there for 13 years at the time. So no problem, I've got plenty of stuff to keep myself amused with. So we went away at Christmas, the end of 2014, Went up to the Gold Coast, where we always went, because my family's there. And we said, all right, we're going to come back. 2015 is going to be the year, going to be gone. And a week after I got back, I got a, a meeting invite. It said, updates. And you, you, like, you sort of look at the attendee list, and you go, that is a really unusual attendee list. There's about a dozen people there. And so I've gone to the updates meeting. And there's a lady there. She was the most senior lady there. Uh, and she was crying. So this is getting interesting. And we go in there, and my boss is on the phone in the Philippines, and his boss is on the phone from somewhere. And there's, there's sort of the 12 of us sitting around with the lady who's crying. And they say, uh, this is the org chart now. 
and it's got names. This is the org chart in the future. No names, only roles. And some people are getting really visibly distressed because think about what this means. And you may have been in this situation in the past yourself. They're suddenly worried that they're out of a job. And they're going, what is going to happen to me? For me, I was reacting somewhat differently. <laughs> and inevitably, this is what happened. They went, OK, that's it. And what was even better, though, than being fired is it was redundancy. And I'm yet to meet someone who's had a redundancy that hasn't, at least afterwards, been very happy about it. It's often a shock, right? My wife had a redundancy as well. But the great thing about a redundancy is they pay you to go. And Pfizer had very good provisions, and I'd been there 14 years. And they ended up paying me nearly two years worth of income to go. And I'd just about walked out without it a few months earlier. So there are a lot of people around that were starting to feel very upset. And it is a shock when it first happens. But once you sort of sit there and you start thinking about what it actually means to have that choice. <laughs> And I was still saying yes to everything. So I was still saying, yes, I'll write that course. Yes, I'll do everything else. And by the time I left, four months later, after they announced redundancy, it was two Pfizer's, which was good, because now it was only a third of my income that had gone. Plus, guess what? I've got a lot of time free now. So the day I left Pfizer, I was very happy. Uh, I don't remember an awful lot about that day, <laughs> other than what's in the photos. <laughs> but it did make me very happy, and it was as a result of all those other things that I now had this choice. And I think back to that blog post I showed at the start, where it's like, I don't know how long I want to be here. I don't know how long my job wants me to be here. But at some point in the future, I may need the choices to be able to do what I want to do. So today, often it means traveling around a lot. So this was in Copenhagen in October. And you know, this is sort of a double-edged sword. So it's neat going interesting places. It also means I was there on my son's birthday. So his birthday was FaceTime. And one of the things that you've got to think about when you're, even when you're just blogging in the nights and the weekends or something like that, is this thing about putting a price on your family. And this is a really uncomfortable question for people. People don't like to think about it this way because they say their family is priceless. But you're all here watching me. You're not home with your family. We make this trade off every day. We go to work. As I said earlier on, usually because we need to make money. And we trade off. And all that happens with this sort of independence and these other options is I've got more ways of trading it off. I could go and get a nine to five job and do the normal thing, or I could be independent. And what it does do is it means I get to make choices about things like this, where I go, hey, I'm just going to go and play tennis with my seven year old as much as I can. 7 a.m. in the morning, sitting down there. I don't have to go anywhere. I've probably got to do some emails. I'll probably work late or work on the weekend, whatever. The thing about that, though, is that it, it is enormously difficult. And honestly, day by day, even this week, I'm continually sort of changing my tolerance to how much this stuff I do. But the most important thing for me with the way I've done this is that it's been something I've done with Kylie, with my wife as well. So we have had to discuss together, like, what is the right balance? Should I go to this event? Should I do this piece of work? You know, are we willing to trade off family and lifetime and quality of time together to do that? And I think the most important thing I'll leave you with on this is that for those of you who have families, whether it's a partner or kids or other responsibilities, is that you've got to have a shared vision on this. If you go off and you just work 110% the whole time and your wife or husband is at home feeling neglected, that's probably not going to be the outcome that you want. So on that note, Thank you very much for coming, and I hope that that's been useful. I know it's a bit different to what I normally do, but I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks, guys.